are you doing? I'm Tom. Um, so yeah, where uh, art and technology collide. Um, I'm not going to show any work, but I'm going to talk about art and technology uh, um, colliding. But I'm going to start with um, this woman. This is Anna. So Anna was born in 1839 uh, in Zurich. Uh, now, Anna is a bit of a goth. Uh, uh, and in her response to technology, Anna is all of us. So I just want you to keep Anna in mind. So how we respond to technology, Anna has the best response, I think, that, that has ever been. So I'm going to come back to Anna. Um, this chap found this photo um, using a search engine. I see that tonight is sponsored by Microsoft, so I used Bing. <laughs> I didn't use Bing, I used Google. Uh, so I found this image on Google, um, and it kind of looks like he would be a barman in a gin bar around here, but he's not. Um, this is Wilhelm, and he's a scientist, and he is um, investigating something here. He is using a light source, and he's, uh, he's noticed that on the light source, um, some patterns are being picked up on a plate of barium platino cyanide. And he's, he's, he's noticed that, and he gets quite excited, and he decides to investigate. Um, Wilhelm Lontgen is his name. So this all happened 8th of November, 1895. He, he, he noticed this kind of anomaly. And for six weeks, he stayed in his lab, and he, and he was bought food and drink, and he, and he just worked solidly for six weeks. Um, and he discovered something that he called Lontgen rays. But actually, we know them as X-rays, because it's a much cooler uh, name. And he won the Nobel Prize for Physics, the first ever Nobel Prize for Physics, for discovering X-rays. Now, obviously, we know what X-rays are. I'd imagine most people in this room have had an X-ray at some point. Um, so it's a technology that has changed our lives, absolutely changed kind of medical science. Within the first uh, year of him discovering X-rays, um, a hospital had set up a department and was, was using it to, to save lives. An amazing kind of technology. Uh, so back to Anna. So remember, Anna is all of us. So Anna was Wilhelm's wife, and she was the one that brought him the food into the lab when he was uh, uh, working for those six weeks. And she was actually the first person, the first human, to have an x-ray taken. So this is Anna's hand. And that is her wedding ring, which is quite a generous wedding ring. So that's good. Um, so she was the first person ever to have this revolutionary technology applied to her, which is kind of an amazing thing. Um, and her response is, I have seen my death. <laughs> that's brilliant, isn't it? That's, like, that's, the mo that's the gothest response to a piece of new technology you can possibly imagine. I have, so he's been there for six weeks. He's going to win the Nobel Prize. He's changed medical science through the technology he's discovered. And her response is, I have seen my death. But of course, she's right, isn't she? So what she was seeing for the first time, first human ever, to see the skeleton without kind of, you know, having a torture applied to her. So the first person to see inside the body, she has seen what is going to happen to her after she dies. And that response to technology, that very human response, is really interesting. I think we talk about te technology a lot as if... Um, how it's going to change the world. We talk about it's kind of it's scientific, how, how it's a tool, but actually there's always a human response within that. So I think, I think Anna is all of us in this. Uh, so I'm a writer, poet and a writer. Um, I write for brands, write for advertising. This is a piece I wrote for um, probably latest um, piece that, that, that was really successful. I wrote, wrote this for the British uh, Library. Um, all of my work is all about people. So I'm really interested in how we can do work for brands or how we can do work for new technologies and where do you find the human in amongst all of the noise, all of the kind of the clatter of life, all the busyness of the world. How do you, how do you remember that we're, we're people and we're human and we have emotions and we have fears? So all of my work and writing is about that. And that's what I think is really interesting about tonight. So where art and technology collide, um, where's the human in the technology? So that's what I'm going to talk about. But first, why do art and technology collide? Um, it's not necessarily that, that they would. You know, what, what is art? Art is, is, is us talking about the world. Technology is, is a tool that we use. Um, they do collide because there's fear 
There's fear about new technology. So I'm going to talk about some of the fears. So Elon Musk talking about AI. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon, which is quite, uh, quite bleak. Going a little bit further back. Have I done the world good or have I added a menace? So that's Marconi, the inventor of the radio. So originally he thought of radio as being one-to-one. -one. Didn't kind of imagine that you could broadcast out, which I thought was quite interesting. And he sent the original patent uh, for the radio into um, Italian ministry, see if they could use it, and they referred him to an insane asylum. So they didn't believe it either, but he thought that maybe it was a menace. A little bit further back, we will soon be nothing but transparent heaps of jelly to each other. So that's about the telephone. New York Times talking about the impact of the telephone. What impact is the telephone going to have? I don't understand it. The constant diffusion of statements in snippets. So that's the telegraph. Um, but it sounds like social media and the fears that we have about social media nowadays. This is a cartoon. Um, I mean, if, you can, if you can read it, this is from Punch, 1907. Uh, the, the caption says, the lady is receiving an amatory message and the gentleman racing results. So I think absolutely, you know, the same fears that we have about social media are portrayed, still being portrayed then. Going even further back, Gottfried Wilhelm, the horrible mass of books that keeps growing might lead to a fall back into barbarism. And that's quite extreme. This was 200 years after the printing press as well. So this is it's not like a new technology, um, but it's a fear still of technology. And then Plato, language, writing, he thought that was a technology that was too far. Writing is a step backward for truth. So we've been worried. We've had fears about technology for a long, long time. It, it, it is the permanent state that we see new technology arising. We're scared about it, and we, we try to deal with it in some way. I think it's because we fear the erasing of human. I think all of those quotes, they're about where's the human in this? Where's the humanity? Okay, so why art and technology collide part two? I think there's another reason, and it's related to this. So you've all seen this quote, I'm sure. It's quite popular, so Arthur C. Clarke, any su sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The idea that we can't understand what's happening, so we regard it as magic. I'm just going to let that image, <laughs> let that soak in for a while. Does anybody know? Is, are there any Scientologists in the room? Ah, oh, look, there's a sign. There's a, are you really? No, okay. <laughs> I didn't think anyone would put their hand up. Um, so that's the guy who runs Scientology. And the weird thing is, if you bing uh, for images for Scientology, um, every single image of Scientology looks like it's been photoshopped. They're all real, but they all, I don't know how they do it. The people look like they've been photoshopped. It's, it's kind of an odd, an odd effect. So um, Scientology, I think, is interesting. It's the first major religion based around technology. Um, so this is something they call the e-meter. I'm sure you've seen kind of programs about this. So um, what you do is you, you, you grasp those little um, sensors and you, you are asked questions about secrets and um, something moves on the dial and they're supposed to read and, and it's about curing blockages or something in, in your psychic sense. It's all bollocks, obviously. Um, so someone recently kind of opened up an e-reader and looked through it and it's just over-engineered technology and it basically measures perspiration and, and electricity in the skin. So it, it's nonsense. But if you do it right, then you end up like this guy. Um, he's quite intense, isn't he? So technology has unblocked stuff and has saved him. Um, and look at his medal. Look at his huge medal. So that's what Scientology can do for you. Um, Scientology is a major religion based on technology. So our response to technology through Scientology is that it's transcendent. So it's not fear, it's that technology can deliver us. It can, it can make us more than human. So there's an excitement to that for the people. I'm sure that within 200, 3 years' time, more religions will be based on technology. So technology, we fear the erasing of the human, but we also celebrate the uh, erasing of the human as well. So that's something that's exciting. So I want to talk about a load of artistic responses to te technology, which I think have all come from um, these fears and these celebrations. Uh, the first is the fascist response, because technology can be quite fascist. It can change the world. Um, so this is, you can just see in the bottom left corner, 
Le Futurism. So this is the Futurist Manifesto by Marinetti. We declare that the splendor of the world has been enriched by a new beauty. The beauty of speed, a racing automobile with its bonnet adorned with great tubes like serpents with explosive breath. A roaring motor car which seems to run on machine gun fire is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? So Marinetti was a poet, not a visual artist, and this was actually the manifesto, the Futurist Manifesto was um, in a book of poetry. Um, and what he's doing, he's talking about the new technology, he's talking about the kind of the, the old days, the Baroque 19th century Italy with its old technology, that's all dead, it's new technology. And it's really weird, the thing that prompted him to write the Futurist Manifesto, one of the things, was that he had an accident with a cyclist. So he was in a car, and he had a crash with a cyclist, and his car got damaged, so he got really angry at cyclists. So basically, the Futurist Manifesto is kind of him going, cars are better than bikes. And that kind of uh, formed a lot of it. And of course, Futurist uh, Manifesto, whilst it's quite fascist, it's against uh, feminism, and it's really for war, and it wants to burn museums, so it's, it's quite extreme, also resulted in some amazing art. And it influenced lots and lots of different art movements. So that was an artistic response to the new technology. Here's another response, the stacking up of TVs. So Nam, June, Paik, um, who, member of Fluxus, which is an amazing movement. Um, I think it's interesting this kind of response, to this artistic response to technology is about the object and it always looks really, really dated. And it, it gets dated really quickly. And I think it's a bit of a dead end in terms of an artistic response. Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, Charlotte Mormon, the cellist, playing a cello made out of TVs that are also showing cellists. So it's, you know, it, it visually it looks stunning. Um, I feel it's a bit of a dead end in terms of an artistic response to technology though. So here's another response. The car crashes are sexy um, response. This is J.G. Ballard. I think he probably had some of the most, as a writer, some of the most interesting responses, artistic responses to technology. Um, talks about car crashes there being a tremendous sexual event, a liberation of human and machine libido. Has anyone ever been in a car crash? No? Was it that? Was it that? No, no. I, th I think J.G. Ballard is kind of over-egging what a car crash can be there, slightly. Um, if you read the book Crash, it is quite sexy. Um, he describes the chests of young women impaled on steering columns, cheek of a handsome youth torn on the chromium latches of quarter lights. Um, so he's a good writer. He, he, may, he, he turns you on by his writing. But it's quite an extreme response. So he's talking about the technology, the speed, the machines that surround us. And he's, he's turning it into sex, basically. Um, a cold response to technology. So this is, this, is, this is when you basically take the technology that surrounds us and have a really kind of, um, well, essentially, you try to turn yourself into the technology. Um, so craft work are weird, aren't they? You know, think it's. I mean, they're great, and they've sort of started techno music, but the whole career they've decided to be robots. I mean, that's that's a that's a big kind of thing to stick to. Um, the thing I like about craft work is, I, as a writer, as a poet, I love the lyrics. I love how cold and austere the lyrics are. Um, so here's an example: I am the operator with my pocket calculator. I am the operator with my pocket calculator. I'm adding and subtracting. I'm controlling and composing. And that's where it goes wrong, isn't it? Because he's not composing, because it's a calculator. So that's a bit weird. And then the next verse is, by pressing down a special key, he plays a little melody. So it's not a calculator at all. It's, a, it's his keyboard. Um, and he's got confused. But I love the fact that they have de they've, they've created an entire artistic career and movement about turning themselves into technology. That's such an interesting artistic response, I think. Then you've got the hot response. So this isn't a story that many people know, I don't think. Um, this is a chap called uh, Johann Fust, F-U-S-T. And if you're kind of super uh, eagle-eyed, you'll see that they're spelling it slightly different. They're spelling it Faustus at the bottom of that. But he was called Fust, and he was a real man. And uh, he was the first funder of the Gutenberg Press. So there's Fust and Gutenberg looking at some print and a little boy all excited about print. So he was the first funder, so he was a gold merchant, and, and he basically funded that business. Then he fell out with Gutenberg, and took him to court, and uh, he won. 
He won the legal battle, which meant that Gutenberg, who invented the printing press, invented this new technology, was out of the business, and Fuss was in charge. So he had all the printing press and all the material, and he went on, and he, uh, this was the first ever uh, colour um, piece of printing. It's a Bible, absolutely kind of gorgeous piece. Um, so he was very successful. Um, now, the thing about the newfangled book technology is that people were really suspicious of it as people are with technology. People couldn't believe that the Bibles, because it was mostly Bibles, could be replicated. Because obviously beforehand they were just used to Bibles being handwritten. So they thought they were the work of the devil. They genuinely thought that printing was the work of the devil. And of course, first, with his kind of mistreatment of Gutenberg and people thinking he was kind of maybe, there was a certain kind of avarice about him and he'd pushed him out of the business and printing was the work of the devil, became the basis of the legend of Faust. And then you've got Kit Marlowe writing Dr. Faustus and actually cementing that religion. It was kind of the first time that someone had written about spiritual matters in, in, in play form as well. Um, and Dr. Faustus, if you know the story, his goal was to learn more about science and technology. That's why he sold his soul. So it's so interesting that the technology of, of books and printing is associated with a very human response, that fear that we're losing our soul. The genius, genius response. Uh, these are a load of um, mathematicians, scientists, physicists in 1927. This was the conference where they really kind of nailed quantum physics. So you've got Einstein, uh, Niels Bohr. Does anyone know who the woman is? Guess. It's Marie Curie. So the only woman there at this famous conference is Marie Curie. And she's also the only person who's got two Nobel Prizes, which I think is really interesting. So what I think is fascinating about the new technology of quantum physics is at the same time, same time they were investigating the atom, they were exploding out the very particles that, of existence. They were looking at, at, at just reality in a new way. We also had the artists creating cubism. So Picasso creating the guitar. And this, of course, is so similar to quantum physics. It's basically looking at, at an element of, of reality from every different angle, which is just what Niels Bohr and Einstein and, and Heisenberg were doing at the quantum level. So I think at that point you had this real kind of simultaneous uh, kind of arising of, of, of responses to the same thing. Then the romantic, the romantic response, which I'm a, a romantic, so I, I like that response to technology. So this makes me feel sad every time I think about this. This is, uh, these are the tracks of opportunity on Mars. So I'm sure we all know the story about opportunity. It was designed to last for 90 Mars days, so only for 90 Mars days, um, but it actually lasted for 15 years. And I'm sure you'll know it died recently. Uh, so these are the last pictures that Opportunity ever took. They're a bit shit, really, but uh, <laughs> it was obviously quite tired. Um, that's the sun. Those little dots are the sun, but, um, you know, keep trying. Um, and those are the last words, opportunities, last words. My battery's low and it's getting dark, I know. It's because he looks a bit like Wally, isn't it? That's why everyone kind of, I think. Um, this, I think this is even sadder, if you're more visual than, uh, it, than words. This, is, this isn't the last photo he took, but it's the last photo he transmitted. So it's being received, and that's when he dies. It just stops. But isn't it amazing? It's technology, and we have this romantic response. So this is from the, uh, the, the guy who was running the, um, the program. Even though it's a machine and we're saying goodbye, it's still very hard and very poignant. But we had to do that. We came to that point. And I don't know if you know the story, but they um, broadcast a song. It is playing, if you could just listen. Very quietly. This is Billy Holiday. <laughs> Come on, everyone sing. You know it. So it's uh, Billy Holiday, I'll be seeing you. So they broadcast this to uh, Opportunity just as he was dying because of these words. I find you in the morning sun when the night is new. If you just spend a moment and just think about Opportunity. Let this heart of mine embrace this. That's another. <laughs> It's only a robot. It's, uh, 
But we have that response. We have an artistic response. We want to send it art. We want to make art. We want to do things about it, even though it's just technology. And I think that romantic is such an interesting response. And then finally, uh, the love in between. Um, so I'm going to read you a poem, because I'm a poet. Um, and this is about uh, Richard and Arlene. And Richard Feynman, um, particle physicist, uh, mathematician, he worked on the Manhattan Project to develop the nuclear bomb. Um, and he got with Arlene um, when uh, they were 16, so super young, nearly that. Uh, and um, they fell in love, but she died really young. She died when he was working on the Manhattan Project. And last thing, I'm just going to read you a poem that I've written, which is about how we find love in between the technology that surrounds us. The scientist Feynman liked the idea that positrons were electrons, moving backwards through time. In the birth months of the bomb, he was called from Manhattan, shrouded project, not the borough, to watch his beach fresh, cool water wife die young. 25, TB. Mysteriously, the mushroom belled bedside clock stopped when she did. He dismantled the device to work out why. A sorrow blasted through him like the litter wind. Years unstable, old spring clumsily fitted, cog teeth sticking to rusty seconds. So when the brisk iodine nurse lifted it to record time of death, the insides unbalanced again. That was the answer. Grief is love moving backwards. Let's try and love each other in between all the technology. Thank you.